Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of The Flower Lounge. I am super excited to have this week's guest. You are going to love this episode and tell all of your friends. We have Kelly Brogan with us. She's a Manhattan-based holistic women's health psychiatrist, author of the New York Times bestselling book, A Mind of Your Own, and co-editor of the landmark textbook, Integrative Therapies for Depression. She completed her psychiatric training and fellowship at NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell University Medical College and has a BS from MIT in systems neuroscience. She is board certified in psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, integrative holistic medicine, and specializes in a root cause resolution approach to psychiatric syndromes and symptoms. Dr. Brogan is on the board of Green Med Info, Price Potenger Nutrition Foundation, Functional Medicine University, Pathways to Family Wellness, NYS Perinatal Association, Mind Foundation, South by Southwest Wellness, and the peer-reviewed Index Journal of Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine. On top of that, she is medical director for Fearless Parent and a founding member of Health Freedom Action. She's certified in Kundalini Yoga, and she is a mother of two. Thank you for being with us, Kelly. I always like feel like I should take a nap during that bio. <laughs> boring, and I think about how expensive it was to accumulate those credentials. Now I'm super excited to be here. So many accolades. It is absolutely amazing. I mean, the amount of time that you put into all of that. I probably would have been better off if I just took a couple of years backpacking around the world or something. <laughs> so much school back to back, but at least it's and I'm only minimally traumatized by the process. <laughs> okay, so close your eyes and go back to your childhood when you were a kid, when you played around flowers, plants, or trees. And just think about what you were doing at the time, who you were with, and what might have been your favorite flower or tree or plant or what pops in your mind first daisy and if you were to visualize that daisy as having a personality what would be the three words you would use to describe its personality hmm. innocent fun and light hmm. Okay. Um, I don't think I've ever been described as any of those things. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly enough, this is typically the, the exercise where it's the way you would describe your childhood flower is the way that you bring your gifts to the world. Yes. So it, it would describe your essence, innocent and fun and light. <laughs> Contrary to my critics' <laughs> <laughs> assessment of me, I like that. I'll take it. <laughs> Okay, so tell us a real story. For the listeners who don't know you, what's your background? How did you get to where you are right now? Why is it that there are articles coming out about you in The Guardian and <laughs> five different newspapers today? What, what's going on? Tell us the real story. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's not that dramatic. In many ways, it's sort of every woman's story, I think, today, because I think so many so many of us are moving through the painful birth canal, but mine started about five years ago, I would say. And prior to that, I was just a regular old girl. I was, you know, I'm raised second generation. So anyone who has an immigrant parent knows that you better get good grades and, you know, stay in line and you get to become a doctor or a lawyer. And those are pretty much your choices. <laughs> worth, you know, my mama coming over from Italy leaving the, the land of Nirvana, you know, to, to raise me and my brother here. So I did that, you know, I went to school, I got straight A's, I was a good girl and set up my, my postcard life, you know, mm -hmm. in the suburbs, two healthy children, you know, happy marriage, et cetera. And as the universe would have it, 
that all got basically torn up and reassembled. So it began basically with my own health crisis is I guess a bit of a strong word, but um, my health portal, let's say, when I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, an autoimmune condition postpartum, and I'd never been a patient before. In fact, up until that point, I was living totally unconsciously. And I, I was joking recently with a friend, I was saying, I can't even believe that I was able to have sex because I was so not in my body at all. Like I literally didn't even know that pooping every other week was like not normal. I didn't exercise. I just, my body was like some rental car I hopped in (laughs) and then I hopped out. And, you know, I had this sort of like curse of always being nat quote unquote naturally thin. Right. So Mm -hmm. seems like a blessing, but of course, many of us who've struggled with our health and have that sort of body morphology would would tell you that it's it's a problem because you have no incentive really even from a superficial perspective to care what you're eating and mm. so, you know I ate McDonald's every day and Snickers and Twizzlers and literally it was like a, I was like a garbage pail for like 30 <laughs> years and um, so I, you know, In many ways, I have to thank my like righteous, like all my shadow material, like my righteous, you know, sort of know-it-all intellectualism Mm -hmm. for steering me on the right path as a, as a new mom, because I had a natural birth, not because I was like some kind of awakened bohemian earth mama, far from it. I had a natural birth because with my first and second pregnancy, because I did the research, you Mm -hmm. know, and I, I had to know more than my OB did about this because I felt very comfortable on pubmed.gov and (laughs) with science and very comfortable with understanding whether a study was well conducted or not. And I did the research on how to have the best birth. And I slowly looked at each intervention, episiotomy, ultrasound, elective cesarean. And I said, no, 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 no. And I was left saying like, you better not mess with me (laughs) because I got this and your, you know, your interventions are not evidence-based. And so from there, I began to research early pediatric interventions, including vaccination. And it was again, through the lens of like, sort of like, you know, aggressive intellectualism that I came to a lot of natural medicine. And then I, when I was diagnosed, I was like, I'm not taking a prescription for the rest of my life, even though I had prescribed to my patients for many years and believed very much still at that point in pharmaceutical medicine. But because I didn't want to do it and I wanted to opt out of having a chronic illness for life, I, you know, I went to a naturopath and put this autoimmune condition into remission which raised, I saw it on paper. I watched mm-hmm. my antibodies come down from the mm-hmm. high two thousands to to normal, and you know all of my hormones correct. And mm-hmm. I, you know, a lot of red flags were raised, and I was like, "Hold well, on a minute! I didn't learn this was possible in med school." And I was paying attention, and and so it was from there that I I sort of went on a righteous tear, and I was really actually pissed that I had invested so much in my training and perhaps been misled. Uh, hey, let me let me just interject here. In terms of your training for people of us who haven't been to med school, what kind of training is there in med school around diet, exercise, relaxation, lifestyle? It's a big eye roll. <laughs> That's mm. what kind of training there is. Yeah, no, actually, this has been been published <laughs> in the literature, amazingly, and a lot of uh, holistic doctors have, have echoed the sentiment that I had a, an hour. Some have none of nutrition-based education. And it was literally like, tell your patients that soda is not good. (laughs) That's basically it. Because medical school is based on the the now antiquated gene-based model. So one bad gene leads to one bad diagnosis leads to one good medication. You know, that model makes no room for the relevance of lifestyle. And it really coddles the victim right? Because it says, oh, you're sick. Here's why. And there's nothing you can do about it. I'm sorry, you know, for your, your bad luck, but don't worry. Here's your medication. Just take it and be a good patient. And so while that might seem reassuring in its sort of validation that something is wrong, 
what it does is it strips you of all of your power and mm. you're left a dependent, um, in, infantilized, you know, sort of. It just reminds me, I don't know if you know this about me yet, but I used to be a, a crisis counselor when I first came back to the United States after living out of the country. <laughs> I studied sociology. So it was, you know, one of the, the things that I could do when I came back. And I remember, so basically in Phoenix, you know, there's a, or in the Maricopa County, there's a crisis line. And if someone calls a crisis line and they can't resolve it over the phone, then they would send two of us out with like a clipboard and a flashlight and, you know, a minivan. And we basically would go to like under the bridge, people's homes, the hospital, like anywhere that somebody was freaking out. They either wanted to kill themselves or someone else or just had like major issues going on. Right. And I remember one of the protocols was like to ask people, are you taking your medications? Like that was, you know, that was a big thing. That was like a way for them to stay on track. That was one of their coping skills. And the other thing that I learned that was really interesting is that when we go out and see our clients, those clients who were on the highest number of medications, I mean, some of these people we were seeing were on like 10, 12, 13, 14, I mean, unbelievable lists of medication that they were on. They were the people who had the, the most trouble. They had the biggest issues. And I mean, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? But I saw a correlation there. Yeah. And that's, gosh, I mean, it's, first of all, that's a really funny tidbit because I worked uh, a suicide hotline that was all purpose myself in, in college. And of course, had the same training. I, it was supervised, this, this hotline, crisis hotline by a psychiatrist. So of course, it was through the lens of, are you availing yourself of the help that society has already given you, you know, your treatment, your medication? And that's why it's so difficult to embrace the potential paradox, right? That the very treatments that are being offered to people through conventional medicine may in fact be the greatest vectors of harm. Like, could it be possible that the treatments that we are offering are themselves perpetuating the very same problem that they purport to resolve? And when I researched antibiotics and acid blockers and birth control pills and psychiatric medications, I found that that was true over and over and over again. That not only is there no free lunch, <laughs> right? Which we're familiar with because we have to listen to the ticker tape of side effects in you know the barrage of, of pharma advertising that we're exposed to in all media. We're, we know that there's a cost, but we think it's rare and we think it's worthwhile to endure the cost because of the benefit. But what happens when the benefit is overplayed and there's an overpromise, right? And then the the risks are thoroughly undisclosed, the real risks, which are that the very challenge you're being confronted with is going to be exacerbated and perpetuated through the medication itself. And, and this is not a theory. I was introduced to this idea when I read a book during my own health, you know, sort of journey crisis, so to speak, called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And this book changed my life. There was a before and after because I never started a patient on medication again after I turned the last page. And obviously I was receptive. I was fertile soil for that information because I had just you know, healed myself in ways that I wasn't educated about in my very expensive training. So you are a psychiatrist and you prescribed medication for how long? So my entire training and even, you know, in medical school, they let you do that. So yeah, so I finished my fellowship, which is like after four years of residency, which is after four years of medical school, I did a, a year of fellowship where I specialized in among other things, medicating pregnant and breastfeeding women, believe it or not. I was one of the first 300, what are called uh, reproductive psychiatrists the world over. And I thought, I have a lot of empathy, obviously, for my colleagues, because I thought I was doing good work. You know, I thought I was providing women information to support a bind that they were in, which is that they were entering into pregnancy on medication and they didn't know what to do. Right. Uh, and so it was a year after that, that I read this book, had my health experience, had a one-year-old and I, and I stopped prescribing that. So I obviously didn't have a very long career prescribing, but I went from being a believer, you know, in the religion of medicine 
to shifting my faith elsewhere. And now you still see patients, but you don't prescribe any medication at all. I only do medication tapers. Yeah, only. So I will never and ne have never since that day um, started a patient on new medication of any kind for any reason under any circumstances. And my patients are, you know, often I'm the last stop, right? So they're often arguably very sick, perhaps the sickest out there, you know, and but by that, I mean, you know, they're either struggling with a number of chronic medical illnesses, you know, bowel disease, autoimmune conditions, et cetera. In addition to, they might think of it that way, their psychiatric diagnoses, which can range from, you know, bipolar disorder to OCD, major depression, suicidality. So it's the whole gamut. But importantly, what they all have in common is that they are ready for a new way. Hmm. And what what do you think drives people to become ready for a new way? I mean, is it, is it the side effects? Is it, you know, what's the wake up factor? Gosh, I think that it's a call to personal initiation. And I think it's a growing sense that there is an authentic self beneath the medication that they long to encounter, you know, and as mystical as that sounds, that's really the conclusion I've come to watching hundreds and hundreds of these trajectories. And I didn't go into this at all, you know, thinking I would be some kind of a spiritual midwife for these women. That was not at all my agenda. And it wasn't even something I would have comprehended when I first started this work. I had to go through almost like my own parallel process to even be able to create a large enough container for, you know, the magnitude of the process that can attend psychiatric medication taper. But what I've concluded is that millions of people today, the world over, are entering into medication-free life as their own initiation to themselves. And it is, you know, for reasons that are very biochemical, um, related to the the habit forming nature of these medications. We were always, I was always told in my training, oh, these medications aren't addictive. Would you say that insulin is addictive to a diabetic? You know, that was literally what I was told to almost mock patients when they expressed concern about the habit forming nature of these medications. And in the past couple of years, maybe four years, there has been literature, medical literature, substantiating and validating what you know, literally millions of people have been claiming, which is that they were never told or informed that these medications would be very hard to come off of and that their lived experience is not that their illness is relapsing when they come off these medications, but in fact that they are going through an addiction model withdrawal. And, you know, they're right. <laughs> it's real. So there is the physiologic layer that can contribute to a lot of destabilization, but then there is also the psychospiritual element of what were you running from? What were you saying no to when you started medication? Mm -hmm. And odds are it's still there, right? And, and, and now you have different resources ideally. And that's why I put all of my emphasis on preparing for this process and how to do that, engage that preparation consciously. But you, you have to walk through the wound, you know, you have to. And most of the time in this process, you know, the, the people and specifically women that I work with, recognize that. And so they just need support in that process. And honestly, all I do is sit there quietly and say, you've got this, you know, it's like, it literally is like midwifery in that way, mm -hmm. where I never, ever get scared and never get freaked out and never send them to the emergency room. And it transforms, it does transform. But often, you know, it can come with a sort of like a shedding of skins that is, um, is, is a hallmark of an initiatory process where you confront your limits and then you blow past them. And you're like, oh, this was in me the whole time. You know, this is who I really am. And of course, that's the phrase I hear over and over and over and over and over again is some, some variation of, I finally feel like myself. Mm. That's profound because, you know, we think, oh, you know, I want to be smarter, richer, prettier. I want to have this, then I'm going to feel good. If I only had that, then I'd finally feel fine. It's not true. Like we just want to feel comfortable in our own skin and we want to feel like who the hell we are, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it takes an initiatory process that our society doesn't 
facilitate for us. I mean, outside of, I would say, natural childbirth, you know, how are we being initiated as, as women or as men? How are, being, how are we being initiated as, as humans to ourselves? We don't have the tribe, you know, and our elders escorting us over the threshold of that process, which at least ancestrally and traditionally always involved some encounter with, you know, some pretty fearful material. But it, it's a conscious encounter that's held by a collective you know, and, and that's totally dissolved in the fabric of our understanding of struggle and suffering and grief and pain as being necessarily bad things that need to go away, you know. So when you talk about initiation, you're talking about confronting and facing your own intense emotional material instead of numbing it or running away from it. Yeah. Is that right? Exactly. It's the tension between, I think, the soul's yearning to manifest and show up and contribute. And, you know, the egos, whatever you want to say, the mind, the personalities, uh, the persona, the mask, you know, desire to retreat, hide, and protect and limit. It's that tension. And in order to finally feel liberated, empowered, and embodied, soul's got to win. <laughs> you know, it's got to be a sort of a, a conquering within that has to happen. And, you know, again, that's what I witnessed. Like as you move through this territory where your mind tells you, you know, scares you into retreating and reversing and trying to patch it up and suppress it and stuff it down and do all the things we're told we're supposed to do when we feel bad. There has to be some force there supporting your soul through that, you know, trial that says, no, 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 this is part of the deal. Just keep going. And what are some of the things that you find your clients doing? Like once they hit that wall and they see what's there, what are some of the ways that they move through some of those things? So that's a lot of what I've devoted myself to because in the end, I'm a pragmatist. <laughs> you know, I've come to these like more philosophical pers you know, perspectives and understandings as I watch, you know, the sort of and make meta observations, but the truth is I'm in the trenches with them and they're like, I haven't slept in six months. Like I, I can't do it anymore. And so of course I am focused on how do you support the process without interfering with it, which is a very different understanding than anything I learned in my training, which is of course, how do we fundamentally interfere with the process? <laughs> is, right. Um, and so that's what's attracted me to setting a foundation through lifestyle medicine. So, you know, nobody in my purview, whether it's my online program or my practice, ever gets the impression that they should just like dive into a medication taper. They only ever do that after they have drained the bucket, you know, so to speak, of toxic exposures and, you know, sort of toxic mentalization and they also have you know restored themselves i'm passionate about you know dietary healing and nutrigenomics and how to change your gene expression through a relationship sacred relationship with your nutrition and also the role of sending a role of meditation in sending a signal of safety to the nervous system so beginning a, a pattern lifestyle for at least a month if not a month and a half of this before you begin the tapering process is not, in my opinion, not optional. Um, if you want to avoid a lot of the physiologic distress, so to speak, that can come with this. But then, you know, what comes from that stronger foundation is less of the physical destabilization, you know, because you can have all sorts of withdrawal symptoms from, you know, gastrointestinal problems to flares of autoimmune conditions to hair loss to stopping ovulatory patterns. I mean, it can get really wild. I've referenced it as like an acute onset AIDS syndrome. I mean, it can, it really is like full frontal assault. But if we can minimize the physical layer of it, then all mm -hmm. we have to deal with, so to speak, or encounter is the psycho spiritual. And that's, of course, where I found energy medicine to be the answer. You know, it's obviously why I feel so passionately about your work and the intersection, you know, between these processes, like physical healing as it translates to free up energy to really um, move through the process of resonant alignment, you know, mm -hmm. with, with
with what it is you're you're here to experience. Also, obviously, I'm passionate about uh, you know other forms of energetic support, whether it's you know homeopathy or you know work with energy healers or work with plant medicine or shamanism. And I think the menu is growing longer and longer and longer. I just did a a training in Qigong, which is such a powerful modality in and of itself. It's like one of the oldest methodologies on the planet and it's still kicking around. You know, we're not going to be prescribing Prozac and doing triple bypass surgery in 10,000 years. So the things that endure, endure for a reason. They're coming back to us and to our consciousness for a reason. And so I, you know, make a menu available to my patients of those kinds of modalities and, you know, including things like tapping or EFT, I'm very interested in self-administered modalities, even though, of course, I, I know so many talented practitioners. I think there's a special power today in the self-administered medicine, so to speak, that, you know, sends maybe even an amplified message to the psyche. Mm-hmm. I agree. And if we could talk a little bit about the birth control pill, because you've done a lot of research in that area as well. Yeah. And how that ties in. So, so I referenced earlier kind of my like militant intellectualism and like very aggressive personality. And I spent like, I think a lot of women, especially professionals today, the better part of my life in my masculine, like dominant masculine energy. And what's funny is that I, I characterize myself as a feminist from the first moment I I understood what a feminist was, I was probably like prepubescent. I, I thought, well, that's who, that's who I am. And girls are better. And I'm here to show the world that, (laughs) you know? And um, (laughs) so I came at, at that feminism from, you know, sort of an egalitarian agenda where I, you know, was going to do what a man could do bleeding kind of a thing, you know? And if I could limit that bleeding, that'd be good. So I, I, you know, I believed in um, birth control as an entitlement. I believed in, you know, elective cesarean section. I believed in, you know, HPV vaccine and any way that modern medicine could support the neutralization of a woman's burden, like physiologic burden. And so it, it, again, wasn't until I began to do through my intellectual mind, the research on the untold story, uh, undisclosed story Mm -hmm. of pharmaceutical side effects that I was like, whoa, I took birth control for 12 years, pretty continuously, because I knew you could, I knew, you know, that I could just basically take it almost all year round. I knew that the the period that you have on birth control is manufactured. And so I knew it wasn't even really physiologically that necessary. So I literally took birth control for almost 12 years straight and I stopped it and I conceived maybe two or three months later. That's not advisable. (laughs) Okay. Just a public service announcement. (laughs) And I learned why, you know, when I was doing this research, I, I left no stone unturned. And of course, I wanted to know about the medications I myself had taken. I didn't even think of it as a medication. I thought of it as just sort of like, you know, almost like a weird vitamin. I thought it was just like an elective substance I took to help myself. And because, you know, birth control like vaccines are some of the only pharmaceutical products offered to totally healthy people without the indication of pathology. It's confusing to simultaneously be a patient and not actually have a diagnosis. So what I learned is that birth control has a lot of evidence-based concerns, including the fact that it drives inflammatory response. Well, most people have heard of inflammation now. Um, We know that it's the language that the body has to express disharmony. You know, it's how the body has uh, a means of attempting to rebalance in the face of a perceived stressor, whether that's psychological, nutritional, you know, toxic exposure induced. Um, So birth control itself induces inflammatory markers in, you know, healthy women. Birth control depletes uh, key nutrients, which is a major reason you probably don't want to just sail from birth control to conception because a lot of significant nutrients, especially in the B vitamin family, are pretty problematic if you've depleted your stores going into a pregnancy where that kind of thing is important. It disturbs 
obviously, uh, hormonal balance, but in some sort of um, insidious ways, like including the fact that it raises these binding factors called binding globulins that then lead you to believe on labs that everything is fine, like with your thyroid or perhaps with your male hormone levels, when in fact there is a, a sub, what's called a subclinical imbalance. And interestingly, birth control can buy you a ticket to the psychiatrist. And now even in a million women study quite recently, there was an evidenced 80% increase in prescribing of antidepressants after teen girls had initiated birth control. Wow. So that's a near causal relationship being established mm -hmm. that you can go from being someone who is, you know, mentally well, so to speak, to encountering elements of your potential for you know, mental instability, if you want to call it that, that manifests because of birth control. So, you know, before you enter into the, to the mill of psychiatry, which is lifelong, typically, uh, before you label yourself as a psychiatric patient, before you think, oh, now I have a diagnosis of, of depression or anxiety or even bipolar disorder, before you become one of my patients where you have to work through this birth canal-like process of coming off these meds, it's important to be able to connect the dots, the causal dots, right? To know that medications ranging from antibiotics to Tamiflu to vaccines, you know, to acid blockers, all have statins well established capacity to induce psychiatric pathology. So wouldn't you want to know that first before you start taking another medication for the side effects of one medication that maybe nobody told you could have driven you um, to develop these symptoms? So, you know, I don't believe in accidents. I believe that the body is, you know, quite wise and has a, a reason for manifesting the symptoms that it does. But it's possible that some of these symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, for example, or hormonal secondary symptoms, are a way that the body is telling you, don't be taking this, <laughs> don't be taking this birth control. So what do you recommend? Because I know even just this week, one of the girls on my team was talking about having to, being prescribed an IUD because of because of some conditions that she was having. And, and I looked at the one that was being prescribed for her and it had a ton of hormones in it. And she was saying, well, I can't take the pill. I, I like got off that immediately because it was creating all kinds of crazy, you know, effects, but, and yet, the doctor was recommending an IUD with hormones. So, I mean, what, what's the deal here and what, what's the healthiest way to go? Yeah. So these concerns and risks, which by the way, I only just scratched the surface of because many actually relate to cancer induction risk and, and blood clots. I mean, I have a, has this tragic story of an activist who woman whose daughter died very suddenly at 21, um, totally healthy girl, woman from the Nuva ring. And then she actually went on to commit suicide herself, just said no. being unable to metabolize her daughter's death. And she was very involved in, in, in activism around this, you know, because healthy women drop dead from hormonal birth control and there's often no warning sign. So that's a pretty big, big risk to take on, especially if you're only using it for contraception. The problem is that these risks attend all hormonal birth control, the patch, the ring, the depot injection, and the pill. They, they are you know, similarly across the board because it's synthetic hormones that are being metabolized quite unpredictably by the body. So another option is what's sometimes called the Paragard, which is the copper IUD, which is, does not involve hormones. I think it's a reasonable choice. Personally, I actually had one inserted postpartum, my first pregnancy, and then and it cost a whole bunch of money. And then I actually had it taken out three weeks later <laughs> because I just felt weird about mm -hmm. having a piece of metal in my uterus. And this is before I even understood, you know, the second chakra and the significance of the uterus as the seat of a woman's power, any of that. I just felt funky about having a pharma product in my uterus. How about that? And so that's a personal choice. Mm -hmm. But I think as far as controlling for the variable of synthetic hormones, it does do that. My preference, and this is you know not meant to be some sort of a product plug necessarily, but just to help people out, my pre preference is for a little gadget called the Daisy. It's a like a like a personal computerized like thermometer but it only has one button so it's pretty idiot proof, easy to use. It takes 60 seconds every morning. 
it took me a while to get in the habit, um, but I've been using it for years. And not only does it help, you know, with contraception, because it teaches you the six days, by the way, in your cycle that you can conceive, like, why would you take a chemical for 28 days to manage six of them? Doesn't make any sense. But the six days you can conceive, it also helps you to learn your rhythm because it mm-hmm. takes you through obviously something you, you know, seem to have known from birth. It took the rest of us a lot of decades to learn about the fact that a woman's body is, you know, a, a cyclical entity. You know, that's, that's news, probably not to a lot of your listeners, but it's news to many of us who, you know, I, I never... Literally, I have two two children into motherhood, breastfeeding, blah, blah, whatever. I had my first natural period, like, recently <laughs> in my life. Meaning that, like, you know, I started birth control right when I started menstruating. I stopped it. I got pregnant, breastfeeding, pregnant, breastfeeding. And it was only after that that I started to actually cycle and learn what a cycle feels like, that there are times in the month that you're supposed to respond to different energetics. Like, you know, I'm not supposed to be exercising during my period. And maybe I don't want to schedule that meeting for that day. And maybe I want to make sure I have a day I can be in pajamas. And, you know, this, this concept is anathema to the American woman's psyche. So a device like that, that doesn't interfere, that just teaches you about where you're at, helps you to develop that intuitive sense of what's actually happening in your body. And by the way, it's, over 99% effective. So if you listen to it and you do it. So uh, I'm a big fan of that. Love it. Love it. And then since I heard you mention it before, because you've done, I know you've done extensive research. Can you just bullet point out for, for those of us who don't know flu vaccine, acid blockers, statins, like just kind of go through and like, give us the lowdown. What's the real deal? Yeah. So again, coming from a mindset where I, like as a pragmatist, like why would you deal with struggle and painful, annoying symptoms if you don't have to? That's what I used to believe, right? And listen, if there was such a thing as the magic pill, as the simple, you know, vector that came in, you know, excised the problem and left, (laughs) maybe, maybe we would have designed it out of a deeper intelligence, you know, humans are brilliant and magnificent creatures and we can, you know, come up with some pretty inventive solutions to our problems. But whenever the solutions involve fighting, you know, like fighting your body, fighting a germ, fighting a perceived enemy, at this point, we have to recognize the bankruptcy of that approach. It just simply doesn't work. And so when we're looking at the efficacy data, right, that's where I come to the conclusion that these things don't actually work. They overpromise. And so then we have to say, okay, so what's it going to cost us? What if there is a small chance it was going to work for me? Don't deprive me of that, you know? What's it going to really cost? Why don't I just try it out? Well, that's where I think I, <laughs> my expertise really comes in because the costs are legion. And sometimes potentially irreversible, even though I like to always believe in the possibility of miraculous healing. Some people do get caught in the pharmaceutical injury ninth circle of hell, and it seems like it might be very challenging for them to come out. So there's nothing quite like that model of waking up, you know, you know that depicts that better than the, than the the vaccine sort of engagement. So what I mean by that is that I don't know of many, if any, other pharmaceuticals that can take you from one life to another life in one doctor's appointment, right? So like single exposure. Yes, people have been gravely injured by antibiotics. Sometimes that can happen. In fact, I have a colleague who runs a website called Hormones Matter, where she catalogs women's semi-permanent to permanent injury from sometimes one dose of an antibiotic, often in a category called fluoroquinolones. So, Mm -hmm. you know, this is possible. I have a patient who took an anti-malarial drug to travel to India, whose life was never the same after that. Mm -hmm. This is, she's not alone. So while that is possible, and while, like I said, you know, there are people who take birth control or insert an Ubering and never wake up the next day to tell the story, 
I don't know of, you know, as dramatic a risk profile to consider as there is with the flu vaccine, you know, that there is evidenced potential for this vaccine to literally result in permanent neurological damage, including paralysis, including, you know, including death. And so when you measure that up against a really almost embarrassing efficacy profile, and now one that is um, substantiated by one of the authorities, objective authorities called the Cochrane database, you begin to sort of say, all right, so what's the deal here? Like, what are we doing? It doesn't really work. It comes with intensely concerning and often suppressed side effects. And, and then we have to ask the question, well, what, what is the flu? Should we be really terrified of this, right? Most of us have been alive long enough to mm -hmm. know that the flu doesn't kill healthy people and mm -hmm. neither does chicken pox. And by the way, probably our parents had measles mm -hmm. and you know, maybe there's more to the story about polio. And so really then we have to sort of get back to the foundational questions of should we be afraid? Is there something maybe we're misunderstanding about illness that illness is actually a part of life, that it's perhaps even an intelligent response on the part of the body. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a pediatrician colleague, Larry Pulevsky, who has gone to great lengths to educate parents about the fact that illnesses, childhood illnesses are essential for proper and appropriate neurodevelopment in a kid, okay? They're not optional, they're essential. And actually, pediatricians of old knew that after kids got sick, they had, you know, explosions in their development, right? Right, right, right. Part of the priming mechanism that's inbuilt. He believes, as do I, you know, that illness is a means of detox, right? What's illness? Puking, you know, diarrhea, sweating, snot. It's all of these, you know, sort of like vehicles for removal, <laughs> you know? Doesn't it make sense that perhaps from time to time we would, you know, sort of, relieve the body of cellular debris and toxicity through that inbuilt means and cooperativity with the, the world of pathogens, right? We can no longer say that bugs and germs are bad because newsflash, we are made of them. <laughs> <laughs> microbes, including, you know, viruses in our DNA, then we are human. And, you know, while scientists debate that proportionality, we know that our genes rely on these microbes for expression. They're in and among us, and it's time for a truce. So what should that truce look like? Well, probably the first step is not thinking that we can, you know, sort of bomb them out of the, our home. It's just not going to work that way. You're going to leave a war-torn country that then you have to inhabit. So that's a, a bit of a, like a high-level tour. But the, the general summary is that I've come to the conclusion that pharmaceutical interventions, by their nature, suppress the imbalance. And so then the imbalance either recurs or a new problem is created. Mm -hmm. right? Even something as simple as acid blockers. I have reflux. Why don't I just, come on, like, why am I just supposed to deal with it? Why? Like, I'm just going to get rid of it. Well, uh, evidence shows that not only will you then have rebound reflux the moment you stop it, of course, because you never dealt with the underlying root cause of the problem, which is probably dietary, but you're also going to incur a B12 deficiency, which could literally lead to things as serious as cognitive impairment and major depression with psychotic features. And if you don't know that those things are related, then you're going to end up in a psychiatrist or neurologist's office on a whole slew of other meds, all for a medication that was never studied for more than six weeks of use and millions of Americans take, you know, indefinitely. So it really comes down to developing a relationship with, with why with asking the question, why? Because I was never taught to ask that question as a prescriber. And it's an inconvenient question for the prescriber to ask, because usually once you ask that question, you are led down a path that makes the medication unnecessary, obsolete, and even reckless to consider using. But, yeah. I, it was just like, it was reminding me of this story of, of, of this woman on my team who was saying that the, her doctor said, you know, this is what I'm going to prescribe to you, but don't research it online because it will scare you away and you won't take it. So, so, yeah. so in terms of, 
I'm so on board with finding the root cause. I mean, that's sort of the whole philosophy behind what I do, asking the question why, and then what, where should we do this research? I mean, where should the average person who's not a doctor who may not have access to the highest levels of PubMed, what's the best way to research for oneself, you know, the real story? Yeah. It's a great question. I mean, the truth is anyone can go on pubmed.gov and look at the published literature themselves. Sometimes it's helpful to find someone that you trust who's done that work for you. And, you know, obviously that's what I'm offering, you know, because there are others like me who have made a passion project of this work and who have not, you know, what I came to is an understanding of you know, as my friend Charles would say, a more beautiful world, you know, that's possible. And I came to that understanding, which necessarily involves a deep reunion with nature, right? And, mm-hmm. and, a, and a deep embrace of a sort of healing that has to happen individually, but also collectively and planetarily, right? And so, and so what does that healing look like? Well, it looks pretty different than fighting a war. You know, it it looks a lot like surrendering to a deeper sense that something better is out there. And it also involves no small amount of grief in that process, right? Like feeling the pain of all that's missing, all the ways we've made wrong decisions, all of the ways we are living, you know, disconnected, as researchers would say, in evolutionary mismatch. And, And so I curate science that supports that worldview, you know, because that's all all science is, and that's why we can get into info wars because there is science that supports many different worldviews. But science is necessarily a process; it's not a destination. And so, as we evolve our understanding, we attract this means of inquiry, which I still have a lot of belief in, you know, and and it supports our intuition. And it's really pretty cool. So, so there are folks like me out there. I'll do a shameless plug for my partner Sayers. Um, I was just going to. I was just going to. <laughs> you know, greenmedinfo.com because he, you know, he's created um, talk about a passion project over, you know, nearly a decade, a searchable index of all of the evidence that supports natural medicine, um, and also is there to make you aware of the challenges you may encounter if you pursue pharmaceutical medicine. So there are, there is information out there and there are a lot of holistic practitioners out there who want to help people empower themselves around their own process. And and what I find is you'll attract what's best for you, you know, whether that's, you know, elixirs or essential oils or, you know, different kinds of meditation or whether it's herbs or whether it's using a whole lots of supplements or whether it's some kind of detox protocol. The beauty of the internet is not in its capacity to inundate us all beyond, you know, (laughs) you know, it's to provide a buffet of choices. And that's why in the end, you know, I get accused of being anti-pharma, of course, all the time, anti-vaccine, everything else, anti-anti. But the truth is I'm pro-informed consent. (laughs) You know, when you know better, you're able to do better for yourself, as Maya Angelou would say. Yeah. And I think, you know, we may be preaching to the choir with our listeners, but what I find very, very helpful is when you have family members. So, you know, you have a parent or a auntie or, you know, somebody that you really, really love who's coming back with all these crazy prescriptions. Or I had a client once tell me, um, you know, I just, I have a new grandbaby, but the parents are saying I either have to get a flu shot or I can't hold the baby. So, you know, just having these resources like greenmedinfo.com or being on your newsletter, looking at your blog, And being able to have those resources to send to the people that we love, because oftentimes the people we love, we're too close to them. They're not going to listen to us or they may, you know, we might be the black sheep or the woo woo ones or the, you know, but our family members may be able to read an article and like you said, get informed, do the research themselves and become more empowered that way. So I spent a lot of years forcing information down people's throats, right? <laughs> Once you, when you go into this, you're like, 
holy shit like everyone <laughs> needs to know this, this oh is yeah it it's shocking in emergency mode for for years and obviously that's why i created my platform but i learned sort of the hard way that people don't change their mind you know through coercive um, <laughs> you know, they're not really open by that so <laughs> but i still believe that those of us who embrace you know natural living and a holistic lifestyle and a more curious relationship to our embodiment we do have an obligation to share information mm -hmm. from the heart right okay. so to say listen we all have our own you know process and journey and i'm not here to tell you what to do but I found this really interesting because it opened me up to a different perspective. And there's some really, you know, smart people who are, are questioning, you know, what we're being recommended. So if you're interested, like, here's, here's something you could read and that's it. Right. The end, because the truth is if you can't visit your sister's baby because, you know, you refuse to in inject multiple, you know, chemicals into your body, perhaps that's part of your journey with your sister, you know, and, and, and perhaps that's like an invitation to find a way to connect to the challenge of that discord from your heart, because of course it becomes very tempting. Trust me to, to, you know, assault the situation with your mind and with science and with no, you're wrong. And here's what, or just capitulate and shut down. You know, I don't know. It's the language medicine has become, you know, many say the last standing religion, right? And the one that is, is most coming under question. And we have to see it as a as a language. It's like a it's a language to communicate our health beliefs about our vulnerabilities and and how we perceive safety and who's the authority. And when you question medicine, you question some of the foundational existential. It's like the umbilical cord many people still have you know, to, to a sense of safety on the planet. So this is no small thing, you know, to come to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The white coat is, <laughs> has a lot of power. <laughs> induction ceremonies. Yeah. I mean, you know, medical school for me was an intense exercise in indoctrination. It, it was, it's a brainwashing, perhaps not by design, but you know, that's, that's ultimately what, what occurs. And that's why it, 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 it cannot suffer any sort of challenges. And that's why I got kicked off of two faculties. And, you know, there is like an inquisition kind of energy around anyone who would deign to just ask questions. Wow. And before I forget, because I know, I know we have some people in our community who would want to know the answer to the short story about statins. Mm, okay. Share. Oh my gosh. Why are there people in your community? No woman should ever take a statin. Can I be that clear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've written about this linking to, you know, actually it was one of my final Huffington Post blogs before I got censored by them and my column shut down. But I, I did write about this with links to the, you know, the primary literature. But again, we can go through the same sort of line of questioning. Okay, so, so are there benefits? Well, it turns out that the argument for statins, and I used to be told, well, statins should be put in the water. They're obviously good for everyone, but it's not, it's not the case. And there is a demographic profile. It's middle-aged men with a history of myocardial infarction. And even in that population, the benefit is literally, you know, as limited as 1% wow. in terms of mortality. But of course, you know, the statistics can be trumped and, and, you know, reported as like a doubling of benefit if you go if you go to one to two percent, for example. So you have to really have a deeper understanding of the potential manipulation of statistics to understand how we could even have been led to believe that these are like some sort of a miracle drug. But in the female population, there is no mortality benefit to this medication, period. But at least that I'm aware of that's ever been evidenced scientifically. So then you have to look at the risks and the risks are, are you know, there's over 200 adverse effects reported um, that include neuropsychiatric um, risks, of course, because your brain is 60 plus percent fat by dry weight. And, you know, we're talking about the mother, the mother fat cholesterol. It's not only, you know, one of the principal fats in your cell membranes, but also it's the, um, 
you know, the mother of your hormones, your sex hormones. And so it's not probably one you want to inter- interfere with directly. There is also then we have to ask the same question. Okay, so so why are we fighting cholesterol? Like, what is the problem there? What is the deal? One, one sort of little tip is that hypothyroidism, so low thyroid function, can lead to a sort of artificial perception that you have a lipid dysregulation problem or lipid imbalance or high cholesterol. So it's very important for women, I think, to, to know whether their thyroids are flagging before they embark down the road of, I have high cholesterol, what do I do about it? So again, it's like looking at root causes and then the root cause of local of low thyroid rather is almost always, you know, nutritional um, or toxic. So it's very reversible. I'm living proof. And, and then we have to look at our theories, beliefs, and philosophies around cholesterol. So many of my colleagues have, have written and talked about the cholesterol myth. So this idea that cholesterol itself is a problem substance and that having high cholesterol is what it sounds like. Well, in fact, you know, now we know that there's a lot more to the story. You want to understand what kinds of particles you have. You know, you want to work with someone who has a more sophisticated understanding of the nature of this very essential component of the human body and how to balance your particular profile out better. But suffice it to say that, you know, I, I believe there is always a better way to address that than statins. And what do you, what would you say to someone who says, well, I want to see the doctor. I have heart attacks in my family history. And the doctor is essentially saying, if you don't get on this medication, you run a really high risk of dying of a heart attack. Right. And there's the parallel sort of warning for that, whether it's, you know, breast, you know, breast cancer, I have a family history, go get your mammogram, whether it's family history of suicide, you better take your antidepressant. This kind of you know, dialectical, you know, experience with a physician is the number one problem. Not only because you deserve to work with someone who believes in your physiology's capacity to self-regulate, okay, but also because that hexing is highly problematic, even on an, as demonstrated in the evidence. When you work with a clinician who uses fear to allow for the adoption of their recommended treatments, that fear is having a physiologic effect on you. Okay, so not to sidestep the question, but that's the first problem. Right. You have to find, this is not hard to do today, you have to find a clinician to work with who has faith in you and your body, right? Who isn't going to use fear to induce compliance. So that's number one. But you also have to know that the new biology suggests that genetic determinism and family lineage is an evolving understanding. It's an understanding that is collapsing under the the heavy weight of epigenetics Mm -hmm. and the role of lifestyle and environmental exposures in genetic expression, which seems to be a principal role, right? So it's really even the BRCA gene, you know, the breast cancer gene, a study came out in the Lancet just this week, suggesting that like, sort of like, oops, it's not what we thought it was. So sorry, Angelina Jolie, that you had your breasts and lady parts removed because of it. The latest science actually is saying what what many holistic physicians and clinicians have known for a long time, which is that there's no such thing as gene equals disease, right? So perhaps if you have a hereditary pattern, perhaps it's because you have been you know, nurturing those genes with similarly toxic exposures, processed food diets, you know, the same kind of stress response system and, and user response sort of habits. Perhaps you know you're you're all folks who who don't feel there is a role for um, detoxification or filtering water. You know these kinds of things. It's almost like belief level inheritance at that point, and it's it's silly to think that it's uh, it's silly at this point to think that it's operating in, in some sort of genetic vacuum. So that's sort of like the the foundational. Those are the foundational considerations. And then if you do in your heart believe that you're someone who, you know, is at risk, then avail yourself of, again, the evidence-based natural alternatives ranging from supplementation to lifestyle changes, go stick with the science. You don't have to get into some sort of like woo-woo territory of like believing in some guru. Stick with the science and just choose the other fork in the road. Mm-hmm. What's your take on mammograms? 
<laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I'm pretty pissed about mammograms, you know, because I look at, I still have that like feminist ire and I feel like look what we've done. We're like lemmings, you know, women, we, we have allowed this system, this patriarchal system consisting almost exclusively of, of male researchers and journal editors and, you know, many, many a physician, although there are obviously a lot of like female OBGYNs who, who might as well have a phallus hanging between their legs because they're that divorced from their feminine. <laughs> and trust me, I could have been one of them. I thought about going into that. <laughs> but what's interesting is the science is coming, is, is rallying around a new story for how to inhabit a feminine, you know, a female body. And what the science is saying is basically stop, stop doing that. <laughs> stop doing that. Stop, you know, treating your body like some sort of a time bomb that's going to go off. And so the, the science on, mam on mammography is now pretty damning, you know? So not only is it suggesting that there are risks to the actual procedure itself and intervention itself, but it's exposing that the benefits to early detection are not what we thought that they were, right? So there's this notion, which is logical, that if you catch something early, that's a good thing because then you can do something about it. Right. So this is true for thyroid cancers, prostate cancers, lung nodules, breast cancer. But the outcomes data on what happens when you do something about it is pretty clear that you would have been better off never knowing. It's weird, right? It's, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that because we think that, you know, we, we want to get ahead of the body's mistakes. But in fact, when you intervene, the interventions themselves carry morbidity and even mortality mm -hmm. that you're exposing yourself to. And perhaps this would have self-corrected or perhaps as the National Cancer Institute admitted in 2013, early cancers like DCIS in the breast are not even cancers. They don't right. behave cancers. Right. I, Worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the hallowed halls, temples even, of cancer treatment in New York City. At the time that my own mother was diagnosed with DCIS, I worked with the head of breast cancer there to have all of her lady parts removed. So obviously, this is a charged issue for me, as you know, it was probably eight years later that then the National Cancer Institute came out and said, oh, sorry, 1.3 million women who sought treatment for DCIS, they probably shouldn't have done that because it's not actually a cancer. So this is what happens. There's a lag. And so the moment that we learn that the risks are outweighing the benefit, we must act because you cannot wait for an authority to come down from on high and say, oh, here's the newsflash, because that can take literally two decades to happen. So, you know, I personally don't believe in screening at all. Personally, for my own body, I don't believe that a screening mentality suits my, you know, approach to inhabiting this body. My prevention is to do five minutes of breast massage every day. And it's not breast lump detection. It's like breast love. <laughs> okay. Cause I wouldn't do it otherwise. I wouldn't touch my own boobs every day. If I didn't feel it was important to develop like a sensual relationship to that part of my own body, which I believe translates to true prevention. The, the, if that's not for you, many of my colleagues, including Chris Northrup, a mutual friend of both of ours, believe in thermography. You know, it's, a, it's another no, no risk means of no. checking in. You know, if, if you don't feel like you can intuitively do that and you don't want to work with, you know, cancer inducing technology such as radiation <laughs> as part of your screening, you know, approach. But, you know, I've written about this, Sayer, you know, Sayer's written a lot about this on Green Med Info. And so, again, if you don't want to take my word for it, then you can read the literature your, or summaries of the literature yourself and sort of see what feels, what feels right. But it's, I think the thing has come. <laughs> So a healthy alternative might be if you feel like something is out of place or feels off, then you get a thermography treatment. They take a photo heat map of your body, essentially. And if there's an issue, you'll see a heat detection of it. Exactly. And if and not, probably we'll just confirm your intuition and then you'll, you know, take steps to rebalance. Yeah, which really supports the idea that the body the body has a tremendous amount of wisdom and will do what it needs to do to take care of itself. I remember having a teacher once who said, 
you know, there are millions of causes of cancer and millions of cures. And this whole idea, this is like a total joke of, you know, funneling money into finding one cure for cancer. It doesn't exist with millions of causes, millions of cures. Someone's might be caused by dry cleaning chemicals if they worked in a dry cleaner's place. So someone else might be a pathogen. For someone else, it could be heavy metals. And so... Right. It's not an entity, right? Because that's how we're enculturated to think. Right. Who's the enemy? How do we fight it? But it's it just <laughs> you actually do science and, you know, it doesn't, that's not how it behaves. And of course, you know, I can't go without mentioning the fact that I had the, you know, distinctive lifetime privilege of working with Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez before he passed, you know, in, a Cornell trained immunologist, oncologist who had the distinction of having the only, as far as I know, multi-decade long outcomes for metastatic and terminal cancers. And what did he do? He didn't do chemo or radiation or surgery or any of it. No experimental pharmaceuticals. What he did was a protocol that involved detoxification, strategic supplementation, and specific dietary, you know, sort of recommendations that resolved anything from you know, mold toxicity to Lyme disease, to Hashimoto's, to diabetes, to metastatic cancer. So how can you say, you know, this is also why I don't really, you know, subscribe to even Lyme disease model, because I think these are just names that we put on your personal challenge, your personal initiatory process, your personal imbalance. And so if you can just heal this whole thing, you know, by taking a, a lifestyle inventory of where and how you could be honoring your organism better, then odds are that that personal message is going to, you know, receive its, its desired response. You know, like he didn't have a Lyme disease protocol fighting the spirochete. He didn't have like a breast cancer protocol fighting that tumor. It was just a you protocol. It was a, you know, how to heal your organism. And also, you know, he was a very faith inducing character. To me, he was like a Jesus figure, you know, where we're just being in his presence as someone who passionately believed in the power of mm -hmm. the body to, to heal itself. You know, perhaps that was really the, the key ingredient, um, because that's certainly the opposite of what you'll encounter at your oncologist's office. You know, there, there's, there's zero meaning ascribed to the challenge, and there's zero you in the process, and there is nothing but this sense of warfare. You know. Yeah, it's a whole other philosophy. It is not, yeah. There isn't a discussion of nourishment. No, maybe like a window dressing discussion. Like, oh, and by the way, visit our acupuncture suite on your way out of your chemotherapy administration. You know, and, and to me, those, th I, again, everyone seeks their own approach. But to me, that's where these things don't really fit together. Like either you believe your body's got every single thing it takes, you know, that, you know, again, in, in this Qigong retreat I did, I mean, literally this Ming Chang, the, the teacher who came out of the medicine-less hospital in China, 200,000 people went through that hospital, had a 95% remission rate and response rate. It was a response rate, actually. So 95% so of the people who went there got better. They didn't do fancy supplements or fancy diet. They just did Qigong. What is Qigong? Oh. It's basically harnessing your your own you know sort of innate energetic potential through connecting to the quantum field that's all it, it's visualization it's like couldn't be simpler as far as i can tell and that resulted in reversal of everything from like ms to paralysis to metastatic cancer so these anomalous right like conventional medicine would like you to think oh these are anomalies but the truth is that we're all starting to you know i have a wall of video testimonials on my website of people who should never have been able to put into remission their chronic illnesses you know there are more and more and more of us coming out with these anomalies to suggest that actually once you can tap in to that innate reservoir you don't even need to take a vitamin, <laughs> you know? Like it can, it can become that available to you simply through the power of your mind. So that's really how I've come to, to have deep faith in the placebo effect as perhaps the most powerful tool we have in our, in our uh, armamentarium. <laughs> this is changing the subject a little bit, but I wondered if you could share your thoughts on feminism. 
or so, just some of your personal experiences around, you know, because you've told me personally about, you know, you are, you identify heavily with being a feminist and yet attacked by feminists. Like yes. what, what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I've lost sort of favor with egalitarian feminism that suggests that we deserve everything that men have and, you know, that we can do everything they can do. Part of the problem is that when you recognize how much is wrong today with the systems that are operative, why would we want equal standing in that system? right? Like the system itself has to evolve. And I believe that women must herald that evolution, right? Like I believe it's only the creative energy latent within women that can envision the next step. The next step is not going to come from anything familiar to us. It's not gonna come from a female president. It's not gonna come from more female CEOs. It's not going to come from equal pay. You know, it's not gonna come from leveraging, you know, sort of this, this notion that we deserve to be where men have always been. We don't wanna be there. This system is broken and corrupt and we need to envision something new. And so, that involves a kind of sitting back quietly into our power that starts with healing oneself, right? And yes. so as, a, as an activist who is very attracted to the idea of getting out there picketing and screaming, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and writing <laughs> blog posts, I've, I've come to understand that what we need to accelerate is the dissolution of the current system. And that's why, you know, I didn't vote for Hillary, Hillary Clinton, okay? Because I don't want more of the same. More of the same is a forestalling and we don't have that kind of time on this planet. So we need to allow for the current system to fall apart and trust me, it's happening because there would not be the death throes, you know, echoing all around us where things are so massively disordered and people are so vitriolically activated, right? Like I personally wouldn't be such a threat to a system that was in good standing. So things are, are falling apart and we need to allow that to happen and maybe even accelerate it by sitting back and focusing on our own personal healing. Because there's a concept in, in, in quantum physics that Rupert Sheldrake has really penned and it's called morphic resonance. And it's this, this idea that once it has happened, it becomes more possible for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that there's this like quantum collective, it's like the entanglement out there. And we're all sort of quietly working on our shit. You know, we're all sort of quietly moving through our own personal birth canal, attracting each other in the process. And we think, oh, it's just her and it's just her and it's just me. It's not true. It's like, it's like this, this sort of like mycelium is emerging through the soil and all of us are gonna come up and rise up, I think in something that feels so different than fighting. You know, and so that's what I've come to believe in. And, and of course, because I have, you know, understood that embodiment, like literally coming into this body is a part of that process because I reject things, you know, like birth control as an entitlement, like formula feeding a baby as a, a way of liberating a woman to go back to work. I reject, you know, hospital birth. Of course, I've invited the ire of a lot of feminists who see that as an entitlement and see me as like speaking from white privilege. And I get that. I do believe people are capable of things that they perhaps believe they aren't capable of. And, and because of that, you know, I've been labeled an ableist, you know, that I, that I, you know, sort of prize and privilege, you know, those who are able to do this. Well, actually, I believe anyone is capable of doing things that they've been told they're not capable of doing. So perhaps that's the greatest act of feminism is, is, is defying even your own personal expectations for, for yourself and your growth and evolution. Mm. So I love that you, there's a quantum physics way of describing that 
as you move through things, you facilitate it being easier for others. I've always felt like whenever I have a really, really tough time, you know, dedicating that so that other people don't have to go through it with such ferocity. And, the, you know, the whole, you know, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama saying that world peace begins with inner peace. And we have this sense of like, well, how can I really make a difference? You know, it's just me doing my little meditation in my room all by myself. But the reality of it, when you look at the energetic ramifications and how interconnected and inseparable we are, that we are in fact having a huge impact by doing what you're saying, just going back quietly, healing ourselves. Simply feeling grief, you know, sensing what is really happening. And then in the midst of it, like cultivating experiences of joy and pleasure, that literally is, I believe, a new form of feminist activism. And, and again, yeah, there's, there's science to support that claim, <laughs> interestingly enough. Where do you think energy medicine is going to go in the next 10 years? How long do you think it will take for something like flower essences to become, you know, pretty widespread, acceptable? Honestly, <laughs> I, I would, if you asked me that last year, I would have said like eight to 10 years. And I imagine many of the people listening would agree that this last year was pretty intense crucible and that things are accelerated, you know, they're accelerating at a, at a pace that makes me feel like, Oh my God, I can't believe I get to be alive during this. Like it's happening now. Like it's, it's happening now. And so I actually, I think this coming year is going to be like a profound expansion. And, and that's sort of what I mean about sort of, things falling apart at a rapid pace where we're sensing the bankruptcy of all these institutions, everything from marriage to medicine to, you know, sort of industry and education. And we're just looking around and calling bullshit on the whole thing, you know? And so what's going to be attracted in its place is these, you know, ancient technologies and this indigenous, you know, sort of in wisdom and all of us who have tapped into an, a means of appreciating what is unseen and supporting processes that, you know, defy sort of like the linear cause and effect that are more complex. Again, my friend Charles talks about the difference between a complicated system like a machine and a complex system like our bodies, right? And so I, I think it's, it's certainly coming quickly. I would say like on the order of a handful of years. Hmm. I didn't feel that way even, even a year ago, but I feel, feel pretty pumped. Like I'm on the, you know, at the front row of like a really amazing climax in, you know, pretty bloody, you know, scene. But I do think that the, you know, sort of denouement is coming soon. And what do you think that is about the, you know, like how, freaking intense last year was for so many people emotionally I thought you know for me I thought well maybe it's just when you hit 40 that things just <laughs> start having experiences that you've never you know intensity levels that you've never experienced before that but when I ask around it seems like a lot of people had a really intense year do you think that the suffering and the willingness to face it has us becoming more empowered and therefore are looking for other ways to build up that aren't falling in with the old system. What do you think? Um, I think that, <laughs> I think what you just said, I think that's exactly, exactly it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I sort of think of my purpose, my role being to hold space for that suffering, you know, for the, you know, wriggling of the caterpillar through the tiny, tiny hole. So the butterfly can emerge without having the chrysalis like snipped open under the, you know, false illusion that that would make things better, easier. So, yeah, I mean, I think the more we do that for each other, the more we do it for ourselves, the more we, we remember that there's a point, you know, there's a design, there's a meaning to the unfoldment, you know, there, we will, it's like, we were, oh yeah, you know, I'm not just here to get a good grade, you know, get an A plus on life. Like that's not the point <laughs> that I'm going to get to the end of life and be like, 
what the hell was that? You know, it's, we're remembering, it's like we're waking up from some like foggy haze and all of this collective wisdom is bubbling up inside us. And that's why we're all coming to really similar conclusions. It's not because we're all smart. It's because it, that's latent. It's latent within us. And that's why it feels when you awaken, it feels like a remembrance, you know? Yeah, lately I've been thinking of it as sort of like we're all sort of like these containers and we can hold, you know, we can hold, we're like a vessel that can hold things and you can add heat and steam and fire. And, you know, we're like these living alchemists of, you know, shit hits the fan and we just added fire and it's explosive. And can you keep holding? Can you just stick with it? Can you just keep going? Just one more day, one more day, one more day. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, like, what about, like, I don't know what you do when something is very, very intense emotionally, like, to just keep holding that container, because things do change. And we always think they're not going to change. I know it's going to. I've, right. I've had the privilege of, again, watching hundreds of women, you know, in my practice and, and thousands of people in my program go through this process. It's archetypal. It's archetypal. Yeah. And so I know that it transforms. I've also birthed two babies, you know? And so I know that what feels like it's gonna kill you, you know, gives way to the most tremendous experience. But if that's the only mantra to sort of keep in your mind it is that it will change. That's like the only guarantee, you know? Yeah, the struggle comes from thinking, oh my God, this is how it's going to be. I'm, I'm saying no to this, like hell no. But it, it never, it never, ever, ever ceases. Well, and I think what we also are never trained to realize is that, and we only learn through personal experience, is that if we can stick with the intensity, it's like there's a coin and there is another side of the coin. And part that's part of the tricky part is like we can't see the other side as we're going through it. We just have to sort of trust but it's like, it's like if you experience great, great anger, if you can just sit tight and sit quietly for long enough until it passes and the physiological effects pass, you actually experience a tremendous clarity on the other side. And so just having that awareness of knowing that there's the other side of the coin, there is the benefit and it's coming as long as you can just hold it long enough. There's a comedian, Louis C.K., um, who's unfortunately come under fire recently, in the heads rolling um, for, you know, sort of um, abuse of women. But he does have a very funny clip online. <laughs> if you if you Google Louis C.K. like cell phone, I think it is, you'll find him on a talk show talk, in, in like a five minute clip spouting, you know, wisdom I couldn't probably even approximate about how we distract ourselves constantly in the moment where we're about to get the gift. Right. So, so the intensity of negative emotion is so, you know, fierce that we'll do anything to keep ourselves distracted. And he's making a joke about being on his cell phone in his car. And, and because we don't just sit in it, we never get the gift on the other side, which is sometimes like a crazy experience of joy. What? Mm -hmm. Like that's, mm -hmm. that sounds crazy probably to a lot of people because they never let it rip, you know, never let it just happen. But it's it's a it's a universal truth that there's like you know a key in the lizard's mouth kind of thing you know that it's it's there just be in it be in it sit in it and there's freedom on the other side mm -hmm. like sometimes within minutes not even like weeks or months you know <laughs> we're so unpracticed at sitting sitting with all that inside that we have to do something about it fix it this is an exception now I have to do something about it here make it feel better, write an email, you know. Yeah. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm most looking forward to. I know you're, you're coming in February to our flower lounge, um, yeah. that, you know, that we're providing a, a space and a container for people to just be and totally let it all hang out and be themselves and not have to do anything, figure anything out and be sort of like a vehicle for collectively intentionally spreading positivity through that. What did you call it? What's the term for it? The, the science of um, the oh, morphic physics, morphic, morphic, resonance. morphic resonance. I love yeah. that. <laughs> oh, I didn't call it that. That's Rupert Sheldrake. But yeah, it's it's that's exactly what you're you're doing and you have been doing. And I think that you and your team have a very 
special ability to hold the shadow and the light, mm. you know, to sort of embrace pain and struggle as a part of the expansion of, you know, the soul. And so I'm, I'm super excited to get up in your mix. I think it's amazing. For those of you that don't know about it, if you're anywhere on the East Coast or you're in a quick flight to New York or you want to take a trip to New York, it's February 13th in the evening. It's going to be amazing. Um, you can find information on our website under Flower Lounge. And for more information about Kelly, where would you recommend, where's the best place to get informed about your more of your work to get on your newsletter? It's kellybroganmd.com. And I know that a lot of people who are seeking information about self-healing want like quick tools. <laughs> so, you know, even though I have, a, you know, a lot of a big mouth and a lot of opinions about these lofty theories, I also know that people want to feel better soon so they can get the clarity to then understand and orient around their process. So, so anyway, we try and offer a lot of those downloads and tools on the page. And can you talk just a little bit about, you know, people who may want to become a patient of yours, but they can't for some reason in um, the online programs that you offer? Yeah. So in my book, A Mind of Your Own, and actually it's almost in its entirely now in blog form on the website for free you know, my protocol is available. It's 30 days. It's not rocket science. Um, it does require a, you know, a buy-in to a lot of what we've talked about today in order for it to be effective. And, and I could even, you know, provide the science for that fact. Um, but you have to believe in it in order for it to work for you. And if you can get those pieces together, there's some in intense possibilities awaiting you. Um, we also... For people who need more, have an online program called Vital Mind Reset that walks you through it step by step, you know, the month protocol and importantly has an amazing, powerful community. So it's an alchemical crucible for sure to hold space if that's what, you know, you really need. Can you share just one or two stories from people who have gone through Vital Mind Reset? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, obviously. So I have focused a lot on liberating people from mental health diagnoses um, and medications. And this program is the first step to the medication taper process. But, uh, it, you know, you don't taper in a month, obviously. But um, yeah, we have some extraordinary, extraordinary outcomes, many of which are video chronicled on my website in testimonial form. But one we just published in a peer-reviewed medical journal it was a woman who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder with psychotic features. She had some of the worst hormonal imbalance I've encountered where she literally became you know, delusional and psychotic before her period for three days. She had been hospitalized multiple times, multiple suicide attempts on multiple medications who in the space of... I think it was three cycles went into total remission. So not only total remission, but then of course facilitated her awakening and she's now going to be coaching for our program and she's just an incredible force on the planet who's awakened to what she's doing here. And so she's totally medication free, symptom free, and then some. We also have outcomes. We have a you know migraine outcome, which is really extraordinary woman who was on IV medication sometimes for months um, wow. within, I think, five weeks had a, a total remission. Uh, lupus case, autoimmune disorder, who in, within two weeks of dietary change had, a, you know, her rheumatologist write a letter saying that she was in remission on paper. She, of course, knew that even just how she felt. I mean, these are dramatic outcomes that probably have something to do with the role of dietary exposures to things like wheat and dairy um, that can be reversed with, you know, and literally within a week, uh, mm -hmm. but also have a lot to do with the power of believing that there is another way and entering into the portal of that process that you can literally, you know, it defies conventional thinking. Oh, you can't put a chronic disease into remission within hours. I have caught, you know, Joe Dispenza and other colleagues who, who've done it in one workshop. People who've been <laughs> their whole life and they walk out of the workshop, you know, healed. So it's 100% possible, but this is the quantum model. 
It's a different kind of science that is predicated on leaps, on these leaps, you know? So yeah, anyway, it's exciting to me. And that's my sort of goal in life is to, to collect hundreds of these dogma defying disease shedding stories. Cause I just, <laughs> it's like why I wake up in the morning. It's the best thing ever. So if you want to hear more stories and I definitely recommend being on the newsletter, Kelly sends out the best, um, the best information that everybody should have go to kellybroganmd.com thank you so much for being with us today such a pleasure such a pleasure lady thank you so much for listening to the flower lounge i'm katie hess and we'll be releasing a new podcast every wednesday if you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation share it with them and don't forget to subscribe to find out what your favorite flowers mean about you take the quiz at lotusway.com